Question 14 of Summa Theologica Secunda Secunde, Treatise on the Theological Virtues, The Virtue of Faith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summa Theologica Secunda Secunde, Treatise on the Theological Virtues, The Virtue of Faith by St. Thomas Aquinas, translated by the Fathers of the English Dominican Province. Question 14 of Blasphemy Against the Holy Ghost in Four Articles We must now consider in particular Blasphemy Against the Holy Ghost, under which head there are four points of inquiry. First, whether blasphemy or the sin against the Holy Ghost is the same as the sin committed through certain malice. Second, of the species of this sin. Third, whether it can be forgiven. Fourth, whether it is possible to begin by sinning against the Holy Ghost before committing other sins. First article. Whether the sin against the Holy Ghost is the same as the sin committed through certain malice. Objection 1. It would seem that the sin against the Holy Ghost is not the same as the sin committed through certain malice. Because the sin against the Holy Ghost is the sin of blasphemy, according to Matthew 12.32. But not every sin committed through certain malice is a sin of blasphemy since many other kinds of sin may be committed through certain malice. Therefore, the sin against the Holy Ghost is not the same as the sin committed through certain malice. Objection to. Further, the sin committed through certain malice is condivided with sin committed through ignorance and sin committed through weakness, whereas the sin against the Holy Ghost is condivided with the sin against the Son of Man. Confer Matthew 12.32 Therefore, the sin against the Holy Ghost is not the same as the sin committed through certain malice, since things whose opposites differ are themselves different. Objection 3. Further, the sin against the Holy Ghost is itself a generic sin, having its own determinate species, whereas sin committed through certain malice is not a special kind of sin, but a condition or general circumstance of sin, which can affect any kind of sin at all. Therefore, the sin against the Holy Ghost is not the same as the sin committed through certain malice. On the contrary, the Master says in his sentences, 2d43 that to sin against the holy ghost is to take pleasure in the malice of sin for its own sake i answer that three meanings have been given to the sin against the holy ghost for the earlier doctors notably athanasius hilary ambrose jerome and chrysostom say that the sin against the Holy Ghost is literally to utter a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, whether by Holy Spirit we understand the essential name applicable to the whole Trinity, each person of which is a spirit and is holy, or the personal name of one of the persons of the Trinity, in which sense blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is distinct from the blasphemy against the Son of Man. For Christ did certain things in respect of his human nature, by eating, drinking, and such like actions, while he did others in respect of his Godhead, by casting out devils, raising the dead, and the like, which things he did both by the power of his own Godhead and by the operation of the Holy Ghost, of whom he was full, according to his human nature. Now the Jews began by speaking blasphemy against the Son of Man when they said, in Matthew 11.19, that he was a glutton, a wine-drinker, and a friend of publicans. 
but afterwards they blasphemed against the holy ghost when they ascribed to the prince of devils those works which christ did by the power of his own divine nature and by the operation of the holy ghost augustine however in on the word of the lord sermon seventy one says that blasphemy or the sin against the holy ghost is final impenitence when namely a man perseveres in mortal sin until death and that it is not confined to utterance by word of mouth but extends to words in thought and deed and not to one word only but to many now this word in this sense is said to be uttered against the holy ghost because it is contrary to the remission of sins which is the work of the holy ghost who is the charity of both the father and of the son nor did our lord say this to the jews as though they had sinned against the holy ghost since they were not yet guilty of final impenitence but he warned them lest by similar utterances they should come to sin against the holy ghost and it is in this sense that we are to understand mark three twenty nine and thirty where after our lord had said but he that shall blaspheme against the holy ghost etc the evangelist adds because they said he hath an unclean spirit but others understand it differently and say that the sin of blasphemy against the holy ghost is a sin committed against that good which is appropriated to the holy ghost because goodness is appropriated to the holy ghost just a power is appropriated to the father and wisdom to the son hence they say that when a man sins through weakness it is a sin against the father that when he sins through ignorance it is a sin against the son and that when he sins through certain malice that is through the very choosing of evil as explained above in pars prima secunde question seventy eight articles one and three it is a sin against the holy ghost now this may happen in two ways first by reason of the very inclination of a vicious habit which we call malice and in this way to sin through malice is not the same as to sin against the holy ghost in another way it happens that by reason of contempt that which might have prevented the choosing of evil is rejected or removed thus hope is removed by despair and fear by presumption and so on as we shall explain further on in questions twenty and twenty one now all these things which prevent the choosing of sin are effects of the holy ghost in us so that in this sense to sin through malice is to sin against the holy ghost reply to objection one just as the confession of faith consists in a protestation not only of words but also of deeds so blasphemy against the holy ghost can be uttered in word thought and deed reply to objection to according to the third interpretation blasphemy against the holy ghost is condivided with blasphemy against the son of man forasmuch as he is also the son of god that is the power of god and the wisdom of god according to first corinthians one twenty four wherefore in this sense the sin against the son of man will be that which is committed through ignorance or through weakness reply to objection three sin committed through certain malice in so far as it results from the inclination of a habit is not a special sin but a general condition of sin whereas in so far as it results from a special contempt of an effect of the holy ghost in us it has the character of a special sin according to this interpretation the sin against the holy ghost is a special kind of sin as also according to the first interpretation whereas according to the second it is not a species of sin 
because final impenitence may be a circumstance of any kind of sin. Second article. Whether it is fitting to distinguish six kinds of sin against the Holy Ghost. Objection 1. It would seem unfitting to distinguish six kinds of sin against the Holy Ghost, notably despair, presumption, impenitence, obstinacy, resisting the known truth, envy of our brother's spiritual good, which are assigned by the Master in his sentences 2d43. For to deny God's justice or mercy belongs to unbelief. Now, by despair, a man rejects God's mercy, and by presumption, his justice. Therefore, each of these is a kind of unbelief rather than of the sin against the Holy Ghost. Objection to. Further, impenitence, seemingly, regards past sins, while obstinacy regards future sins. Now past and future time do not diversify the species of virtues or vices, since it is the same faith whereby we believe that Christ was born, and those of old believed that he would be born. Therefore, obstinacy and impenitence should not be reckoned as two species of sin against the Holy Ghost. Objection 3. Further, Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, according to John 1.17. Therefore, it seems that resistance of the known truth and envy of a brother's spiritual good belong to blasphemy against the Son rather than against the Holy Ghost. Objection 4. Further, Bernard says, in his Book of Precepts and Dispensations 11, that to refuse to obey is to resist the Holy Ghost. Moreover, a gloss on Leviticus 10.16 says that a feigned repentance is a blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Again, schism is, seemingly, directly opposed to the Holy Ghost by whom the Church is united together. Therefore, it seems that the species of sins against the Holy Ghost are insufficiently enumerated. On the contrary, Augustine, in his letter to Peter on the Faith, 3, says that those who despair of pardon for their sins, or who without merits presume on God's mercy, sin against the Holy Ghost. And in the Inchiridion, 83, that he who dies in a state of obstinacy is guilty of the sin against the Holy Ghost. And in his sermon 71 on the word of the Lord, that impenitence is a sin against the Holy Ghost. And in his commentary on the Lord's Sermon on the Mount 22, that to resist fraternal goodness with the brands of envy is to sin against the Holy Ghost and in his book on the one baptism he says that a man who spurns the truth is either envious of his brethren to whom the truth is revealed or ungrateful to god by whose inspiration the church is taught and therefore seemingly sins against the holy ghost i answer that the above species are fittingly assigned to the sin against the Holy Ghost taken in the third sense, because they are distinguished in respect of the removal or contempt of those things whereby a man can be prevented from sinning through choice. These things are either on the part of God's judgment, or on the part of his gifts, or on the part of sin. For by consideration of the divine judgment, wherein justice is accompanied with mercy, man is hindered from sinning through choice, both by hope, arising from the consideration of the mercy that pardons sins and rewards good deeds, which hope is removed by despair. 
and by fear arising from the consideration of the divine justice that punishes sin which fear is removed by presumption when namely a man presumes that he can obtain glory without merits or pardon without repentance god's gifts whereby we are withdrawn from sin are two one is the acknowledgment of the truth against which there is the resistance of the known truth when namely a man resists the truth which he has acknowledged in order to sin more freely while the other is the assistance of inward grace against which there is envy of a brother's spiritual good when namely a man is envious not only of his brother's person but also of the increase of divine grace in the world on the part of sin there are two things which may withdraw man therefrom one is the inordinateness and shamefulness of the act the consideration of which is wont to arouse man to repentance for the sin he has committed and against this there is impenitence not as denoting permanence in sin until death in which sense it was taken above for thus it would not be a special sin but a circumstance of sin but as denoting the purpose of not repenting the other thing is the smallness or brevity of the good which is sought in sin according to romans six twenty one what fruit had you therefore then in those things of which you are now ashamed the consideration of this is wont to prevent man's will from being hardened in sin and this is removed by obstinacy whereby man hardens his purpose by clinging to sin of these two it is written in jeremiah eight six there is none that doth penance for his sin saying what have i done as regards the first and they are all turned to their own course as a horse rushing to the battle as regards the second reply to objection one the sins of despair and presumption consist not in disbelieving in god's justice and mercy but in contemning them reply to objection two obstinacy and impenitence differ not only in respect of past and future time but also in respect of certain formal aspects by reason of the diverse consideration of those things which may be considered in sin as explained above reply to objection three grace and truth were the work of christ through the gifts of the holy ghost which he gave to men reply to objection four to refuse to obey belongs to obstinacy while a feigned repentance belongs to impenitence and schism to the envy of a brother's spiritual good whereby the members of the church are united together third article whether the sin against the holy ghost can be forgiven objection one it would seem that the sin against the holy ghost can be forgiven for augustine says in on the word of the lord sermon 71 we should despair of no man so long as our lord's patience brings him back to repentance but if any sin cannot be forgiven it would be possible to despair of some sinners therefore the sin against the holy ghost can be forgiven objection to further no sin is forgiven except through the soul being healed by god but no disease is incurable to an all-powerful physician as a gloss says on psalm one hundred and two three who healeth all thy diseases therefore the sin against the holy ghost can be forgiven objection three further the free will is indifferent to either good or evil now 
so long as man is a wayfarer, he can fall away from any virtue, since even an angel fell from heaven, wherefore it is written in Job 4, 18 and 19. In his angels he found wickedness. How much more shall they that dwell in houses of clay? Therefore, in like manner, a man can return from any sin to the state of justice. Therefore, the sin against the Holy Ghost can be forgiven. On the contrary, it is written in Matthew 12:32. He that shall speak against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, nor in the world to come. And Augustine says, in his commentary on the Lord's Sermon on the Mount, 122, that, So great is the downfall of this sin, that it cannot submit to the humiliation of asking for pardon. I answer that, According to the various interpretations of the sin against the Holy Ghost, there are various ways in which it may be said that it cannot be forgiven. For if by the sin against the Holy Ghost we understand final impenitence, it is said to be unpardonable, since in no way is it pardoned, because the mortal sin wherein a man perseveres until death will not be forgiven in the life to come since it was not remitted by repentance in this life. According to the other two interpretations, it is said to be unpardonable, not as though it is nowise forgiven, but because, considered in itself, it deserves not to be pardoned, and this in two ways. First, as regards the punishment, since he that sins through ignorance or weakness deserves less punishment, whereas he that sins through certain malice can offer no excuse in alleviation of his punishment. Likewise, those who blasphemed against the Son of Man before his Godhead was revealed could have some excuse on account of the weakness of the flesh which they perceived in him, and hence they deserved less punishment. Whereas those who blasphemed against his very Godhead by ascribing to the devil the works of the Holy Ghost, had no excuse in diminution of their punishment. Wherefore, according to Chrysostom's commentary, in his homily 42 on Matthew, the Jews are said not to be forgiven this sin, neither in this world nor in the world to come, because they were punished for it, both in the present life, through the Romans, and in the life to come, in the pains of hell. Thus also Athanasius adduces the example of their forefathers who, first of all, wrangled with Moses on account of the shortage of water and bread, and this the Lord bore with patience, because they were to be excused on account of the weakness of the flesh. But afterwards they sinned more grievously when, by ascribing to an idol the favors bestowed by God who had brought them out of Egypt, they blasphemed, so to speak, against the Holy Ghost, saying, in Exodus 32.4, These are thy gods, O Israel, that have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Therefore the Lord both inflicted temporal punishment on them, since there were slain on that day about three and twenty thousand men, Exodus 32.28, and threatened them with punishment in the life to come, saying, in Exodus 32.34, I, in the day of revenge, will visit this sin of theirs. Secondly, this may be understood to refer to the guilt. Thus a disease is said to be incurable in respect of the nature of the disease, which removes whatever might be a means of cure, as when it takes away the power of nature or causes loathing for food and medicine, although God is able to cure such a disease. So, too, the sin against the Holy Ghost is said to be unpardonable by reason of its nature, insofar as it removes those things which are a means towards the pardon of sins. 
This does not, however, close the way of forgiveness and healing to an all-powerful and merciful God, who sometimes, by a miracle, so to speak, restores spiritual health to such men. Reply to Objection 1. We should despair of no man in this life, considering God's omnipotence and mercy. But if we consider the circumstances of sin, some are called, in Ephesians 2, 2, children of despair. Translator's note, filios diffidentiae, which the Douay version renders children of unbelief. Reply to Objection 2. This argument considers the question on the part of God's omnipotence, not on that of the circumstances of sin. Reply to Objection 3. In this life, the free will does indeed ever remain subject to change, yet sometimes it rejects that whereby, so far as it is concerned, it can be turned to good. Hence, considered in itself, this sin is unpardonable, although God can pardon it. Fourth article. Whether a man can sin, first of all, against the Holy Ghost. Objection 1. It would seem that a man cannot sin, first of all, against the Holy Ghost, without having previously committed other sins. For the natural order requires that one should be moved to perfection from imperfection. This is evident as regards good things, according to Proverbs 4.18. The path of the just, as a shining light, goeth forwards and increases even to perfect day. Now, in evil things, the perfect is the greatest evil, as the philosopher states in Metaphysics 5.21. Since, then, the sin against the Holy Ghost is the most grievous sin, it seems that man comes to commit this sin through committing lesser sins. Objection to, further, to sin against the Holy Ghost is to sin through certain malice or through choice. Now man cannot do this until he has sinned many times, for the philosopher says in Ethics 5, 6, and 9 that Although a man is able to do unjust deeds, yet he cannot all at once do them as an unjust man does, notably from choice. Therefore, it seems that the sin against the Holy Ghost cannot be committed except after other sins. Objection 3. Further, repentance and impenitence are about the same object. But there is no repentance except about past sins. Therefore, the same applies to impenitence, which is a species of the sin against the Holy Ghost. Therefore, the sin against the Holy Ghost presupposes other sins. On the contrary, it is easy in the eyes of God, on a sudden, to make a poor man rich. Ecclesiasticus 11.23. Therefore, conversely, it is possible for a man, according to the malice of the devil who tempts him, to be led to commit the most grievous of sins which is that against the Holy Ghost. I answer that, as stated above in Article 1, in one way to sin against the Holy Ghost is to sin through certain malice. Now one may sin through certain malice in two ways, as stated in the same place. First, through the inclination of a habit. But this is not, properly speaking, to sin against the Holy Ghost. Nor does a man come to commit this sin all at once, inasmuch as sinful acts must precede so as to cause the habit that induces to sin. Secondly, one may sin through certain malice, by contemptuously rejecting the things whereby a man is withdrawn from sin. This is, properly speaking, to sin against the Holy Ghost, as stated above in Article 1. 
and this also for the most part presupposes other sins for it is written in proverbs eighteen three that the wicked man when he has come into the depths of sin contemneth nevertheless it is possible for a man in his first sinful act to sin against the holy ghost by contempt both on account of his free will and on account of the many previous dispositions or again through being vehemently moved to evil while but feebly attached to good hence never or scarcely ever does it happen that the perfect sin all at once against the holy ghost wherefore origen says in his peri archon one three i do not think that any one who stands on the highest step of perfection can fail or fall suddenly this can only happen by degrees and bit by bit the same applies if the sin against the holy ghost be taken literally for blasphemy against the holy ghost for such blasphemy as our lord speaks of always proceeds from contemptuous malice if however with augustine in on the word of the lord homily seventy one we understand the sin against the holy ghost to denote final impenitence it does not regard the question in point because this sin against the holy ghost requires persistence in sin until the end of life reply to objection one movement both in good and in evil is made for the most part from imperfect to perfect according as man progresses in good or evil and yet in both cases one man can begin from a greater good or evil than another man does consequently that from which a man begins can be perfect in good or evil according to its genus although it may be imperfect as regards the series of good or evil actions whereby a man progresses in good or evil reply to objection to this argument considers the sin which is committed through certain malice when it proceeds from the inclination of a habit reply to objection three if by impenitence we understand with augustine in his homily seventy one on the word of the lord persistence in sin until the end it is clear that it presupposes sin just as repentance does if however we take it for habitual impenitence in which sense it is a sin against the holy ghost it is evident that it can precede sin for it is possible for a man who has never sinned to have the purpose either of repenting or of not repenting if he should happen to sin end of question 14 read by michael shane craig lambert lc